Uh, today, I want to present to you the Great Mini Bar Challenge of 2019. Uh, so this is also subtitled as Supervised Drinking with Jen. If you know me, you know that we're all about the supervised drinking. And uh, folks, if you're watching this, please drink responsibly. And uh, don't do like what we do in Boston. It's just not a good show. <laughs> so all right, here we go. So hello, my name is Jen Looper, and I am a new cloud developer advocate lead at Microsoft. So I wore my sparkly shirt on this occasion. I'm so excited because it was on sale. So this like speaks to me a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm also the founder and CEO at View Vixens. Yes, and I have my worldwide community coordinator here. Are you organizer or, co or coordinator? I'll be whatever you want me to be. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is Diana, and she's our uh, worldwide community organizer, and she helps uh, all find chapter leads all over the world and um, to join our community. Vue Vixens is all about helping uh, women and people who identify as women come into the Vue.js community and find empowerment and support. Uh, we have a really amazing Slack channel where people can get code help, where you can you know, network and find your next job. But we've had a lot of success with people getting placement. So it's been very, very nice to see. Um, started about a year ago. And uh, at this point, we have 20 chapters worldwide. So we scaled like no tomorrow. And um, it's been a, a wild ride with a lot of sleepless nights, but a lot of good fun. So find us on viewvixens.org. Uh, so I'm also the organizer of the Boston Vue.js meetup. So we try to have meetups every other month. Uh, we have demand for every month, but it's hard to find speakers. So if you're ever in Boston and you want to talk about Vue, please look us up. We are aiming to be the most lit meetup in Boston, uh, which is a high bar, but um, no pun intended. So um, that's our logo. You can see if you know the Citgo sign in Boston, that's what we're, that's what we're channeling. And you can always find me on Twitter at uh, Jen Looper. So thank you for coming to this talk. Um, I am not only all of those things, but I'm also the inventor of the Vue Teeny. So um, I will give you the recipe if you're very, very nice. <laughs> um, I started out using, what is that green liquor? Uh, Midori. It's the worst thing in the universe. It makes a great color, but you don't want to use that stuff. It's so gross. So this is like an apple teeny, except I just rebranded it with a kiwi on it in the view shape. So that's the view teeny. So we, we had this in the Boston <laughs> Vue.js meetup, and it's very nice. Um, and I'm also queen of the apps, according to the Wellesley Weston magazine. So it must be true. Uh, that was, and I love how they got the picture of me looking absolutely crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's, that's fun. Um, I do love, I do love mobile apps. And uh, I like to create them. I also travel a lot. This is my trip from trips from 2018. I think they said there were 47. Some of that has to be commuting to Bedford, which is literally a trip in and of itself. But um, <laughs> there's a lot of schlepping going on. There's a lot of running around uh, as, as developer advocates. I'm actually trying to, to tamp down a little bit. Um, but that was what was happening in 2018. And that was what inspired this talk, because I run around all over the world. What do you do when you go to a strange hotel room? Well, what I do is I look under the bed, because in, bulk, in a certain country that shall be unnamed, I found a syringe. So um, I always look under the bed, and then I go to the mini bar, <laughs> depending on what I find under the bed. So look in the mini bar and see uh, what you find. Uh, in Amsterdam, they're completely empty. This is a travesty. So however, in this wonderful hotel, I had a great mini bar with these little bottles. So um, I have a question for you. In Boston, we call these nips, nip bottles. And I give this talk in Europe, and the British all are all on the floor rolling because nips means something completely different in England. Um, what do you call these little bottles of liquor in the mini bars in the South? Do they have a name? Oh, yeah. Pints? No, they're called... Uh, Small bottles? Nip, nips. <laughs> they're nips. nips. Thank you. They are nips. <laughs> they are nips. <laughs> OK, this... <laughs> yes, when you see like piles of nip bottles, you know that you're not in the right neighborhood. <laughs> so good fun. OK, so that's all about what inspired the creation of this whole weird project that I'm going to demo for you today. Um, and also the fact that I really do love building mobile apps. Uh, and the way I enjoy building mobile apps is using NativeScript Vue. So uh, NativeScript is a product that is an open source and free product that I have been working with for the past five years or so at my previous company. Currently at Microsoft, we don't have a great NativeScript story, but maybe that will change now that I'm there. So, um, <laughs> And the cool thing about NativeScript is you can use uh, this free and open source project to build downloadable mobile apps for iOS and Android written in Angular, or no framework at all, or Vue.js, that's NativeScript Vue. Um, or you can also, actually, there's a new port for React. 
So some community member is doing an incredible port for React, which I'm, I'm amazed at. But it's quite a versatile framework so that you can use your JavaScript flavor of choice to write downloadable mobile apps uh, similar to React Native, except you're not locked into React. So that's cool. Put all of this stuff together that I just mentioned, and what do you get? You get the dream. You get the supervised drinking. So what if we could create a mobile app that would make my life easier in a hotel after checking under the bed, you know, what goes on in the minibar. Making sense of that minibar by suggesting cocktails that you could make, right? Wouldn't it be cool if you could just like take your phone and, with a special app and scan the minibar and see, you know, what permutations you could create to make something nice? Uh, you got the corporate credit card, you may as well, you know? So <laughs> um, do it in NativeScript view because that's fun. It's a great way to create a mobile app. Make it an intelligent app. Make it a smart app. Make it something that has a little AI behind it, because that's fashionable, right? Um, and, and have some fun while you're at it. So that's the goal. That's what we're going to do today. And I'm going to show you how to do this. So your first thought when you say, OK, I'm going to make an intelligent mobile app to scan my, uh, my mini bar and see what cocktails I can make, um, you know, you, your manager is going to say, well, that sounds like you need to make an AI, right? Um, well, you know, gut check on the AI business, uh, when you see these kind of tweets coming, it, it's kind of small, but it says half the time when companies say they need AI, what they really need is a select clause with group by. So <laughs> um, we have to be a little careful when we're talking about, you know, smart apps, intelligent apps, AI, ML, all of these jargon phrases that are thrown around. Why don't we just say we're going to put a little machine learning behind this and see how far we can push the envelope? That would probably be a better and more accurate thing to say. OK, so we decided that we're going to make an intelligent app. We're going to use some machine learning behind it. What's your first step? This is a huge field, and a lot of people are very lost in it. You know, you, you want to make something interesting. You want to use machine learning. Where do you start? A great place that a lot of people are starting is on Kaggle. How many Kagglers are on here? Kaggle is so fun. <laughs> and it was bought by Google, I believe. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. So you go on to Kaggle, and they do all kinds of hackathons, all kinds of cool challenges. Um, and it turns out that on Kaggle, they've got a, a data set called um, cocktail, co the Cocktail Database. It was scraped off of the CocktailDB.com, which is a crowdsourced batch of kind of so-so, some real, some fake cocktails that are kind of slapped together and put into there. There are 500 of them in this data set. Personally, that's not enough cocktailing. <laughs> that's not a big enough data set for what I needed. I didn't love the quality of the cocktails. They're kind of cobbled together. And you know, um, I wanted something a little bit more, um, more accurate, more vetted. So in my opinion, not enough cocktailing is going on in that particular data set, but at least it gives you an idea of what you can do in Kaggle and what's available in Kaggle. Create an account. Maybe we can create our own data set and see where we go from there. All right. So turn to the internet, because all things <laughs> worth bothering with are on the internet, right? So I went to take a look at this lady who created the Bot Cocktails Twitter account. So this is a really fun Twitter account that you can follow, to, and she tweets out uh, fake cocktails periodically. <laughs> so. Um, and Beth Squarecki um, had a sort of a little Twitter thread about how she created bot cocktails. And somebody asked, what did you use for the recipes? I'd love to see it made with the Mr. Boston Bartender's Guide. Who knows what the Mr. Boston Bartender's Guide is here? It's very specific domain knowledge here. Aha, we have the drinkers in the front row. OK. <laughs> this is the Mr. Boston <laughs> official bartending guide, reprinted from 1935. Did you know in, in the 30s, they were putting a lot of eggs in these cocktails? Raw eggs. Let me see if I can just, like, just by opening randomly. Fresh mint, old Mr. Boskin whiskey, and a jigger of sweetened lemon juice. Slap in some absinthe, and a little bit more absinthe than the juice of half an orange. <laughs> It just is a headache waiting to happen, you know? <laughs> this is fascinating, though, because what it was was um, it was a small book, smaller than this in the 30s, and every bartender had it, you know, just in case somebody asks something weird. My dad always goes to bars and asks for fog cutters. Nobody knows what a fog cutter is. <laughs> it's in here. <laughs> so the old school cocktail Bible, that is it. And it's, you can get it reprinted on Amazon. It's really fun um, if you like eggs. <laughs> Turns out, if you start grounding around in the internet a little bit more is that the brand Mr. Boston has been bought by the people who own Sazerac. 
So um, if you've been to New Orleans, Sazerac is the, um, the city drink of New Orleans. It's also a brand. They have somehow bought the brand name for Mr. Boston, and they have a really nice website uh, for Mr. Boston cocktails. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to sell product. So Mr. Boston is a brand now of, of drinks, uh, drink bottles that you can buy, like the big ones to make mixers. Um, so you go onto the website. Guess what? <laughs> that website has a scrapable API if you start digging around in the source code. <laughs> Um, and you can scrape a heck of a lot of really interesting data out of it. <laughs> so here you can barely see it, but this is the JSON, very standard JSON for this particular cocktail, which is called the Airmail, which has uh, rum, lime juice, some kind of syrup, and champagne. <laughs> that just like, actually doesn't sound too bad. Um, but you can just scrape the heck out of it using this API, and then you're going to fall in love with Excel. <laughs> So Excel, for all the data scientists out there, you're going to be, in, you're going to be parked in Excel. So Excel was my, was my game all over Christmas vacation. So, um, because I scraped um, about 990 cocktails out of this API, and I put it all into Excel, cleaned it and cleaned it and cleaned it some more, got out the dupes, got out the weird advertisements, and that is just really time consuming. I have a feeling that this is what uh, data scientists do about 75% of their time is they're just scraping and cleaning and scraping and cleaning, and you're like, yes, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, once it's clean enough, you can import that right back into Kaggle. Uh, so now on Kaggle for public consumption is the Mr. Boston cocktail data set. I did email the Sazerac people to ask if it's okay to do this. I never heard back, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> But the cool thing about Kaggle is that you can kind of um, use their charts and graphs uh, by running some Python scripts um, on the fly in Kaggle itself. And it shows some, the logic of the data, and I really like that. So you can see here that most um, cocktails, if you get rid of the cocktail classics, you can see that the biggest ingredient is vodka, and then rum, and then whiskeys, and then tequila and brandy. So it kind of makes sense according to you know, drink preferences and fashions as they, of drinks as they, um, as they went forward through time. So Kaggle is a great way to kind of get a gut check and a reality check on your data. So you are in the money at this point. So this is a very good thing. Once you can see that your data makes logical sense. OK, we've got data. We've got a massive Excel spreadsheet. We've got um, all of the data scraped out of JSON and imported into spreadsheet, imported into Kaggle. Now it's time to create a mobile app. So what I do is I go to the NativeScript CLI, a very nice CLI that you can use to just spin up uh, a mobile app. So what you're going to need when using the CLI is you're going to need Xcode if you're an iOS developer like I am, or uh, Android Studio, or both if you want to do cross-platform, which you might want to do. Um, and so you just use TNS, which is Telerik Native Script, TNS Create, and then it'll give you a little wizard and says, I want to create um, a view app. And then it'll walk you through you know, the screens that you want to add if you want to do any of that stuff. Or just scaffold out a plain old app, and this code looks very classic view. Right, you've got home view, you've got app.js where the, the scaffolding basically starts, and then in home view you can see this kind of classic component, view.js component. How many view levers have I got in here? Vue.js people? Angular people? React? Oh, interesting. Okay, that's actually kind of another classic data sampling right there. <laughs> Very cool. Well, anyway, this is what a view component looks like. It has a template block, a script block, and a style block. So um, for the React folks, this might look kind of familiar. In an Angular context, this would all be broken up into separate files. So um, it's all trying to do the same thing, basically get some logic around how you're going to lay out your app. Um, what's different in this markup that you'll notice is that we have, uh, in the template block, we have a page, and then we have some weird markup. We have an action bar, which doesn't look like view. So these are actually native script components. This is your mobile um, action bar at the top. There's also a grid layout here with a label and, um, and a couple formatted strings and spans. Uh, so this is basically leveraging native script components, native script modules that we've built. So it's kind of um, abstracting away some of the complexity of building uh, a native mobile app because you want your native action bar, but believe me, you don't want to write that thing yourself. <laughs> so here we have modules ready for you, so you just like paste it in, and then you've got a native um, um, action bar. So that's very helpful. Okay, so that's what your code is basically looking like. If you would run this basic app in an emulator, we have an Android app and an iOS app, and it's a blank view app. Nothing too exciting, but you know, you see the action bar at the top, and then a screen with a little formatted string right in the middle in the grid layout. 
which you're going to know and love. So, OK, this doesn't look very impressive, right? This is a basic mobile app. There's nothing much of interest going on here. And now this is the point where I need audience participation, because I need you to be impressed with my design skills, OK? So I want to hear some oohs and ahs, OK? So ready for the icon? OK, get ready. This is the icon. <laughs> this is the logo. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of pretty. <laughs> so this is actually a grid layout within a scroll view. So you have your grid layout, and then you can scroll right on up with a tab, a custom design tab, tab bar at the bottom, because native, <laughs> native mobile tabs are hideous, and you don't want to use them. So you just do a custom one. Um, and I don't actually like action bars, so I always blow them away. So here we are. Um, uh, new fashion in mobile apps is kind of more minimalistic nowadays. But I like deep colors, because it gets you into the mini bar experience. You know, you're ready to go. OK, so this is the app. This is what it basically looks like. It has three elements. It has um, the choice of you know, taking a look at what could be in your bar, pressing a bottle, and getting some suggested recipes, and then some other stuff that we'll take a look at as we go through the tabs. All right, we have our app designed. We have our data, at least in Kaggle. And now we need to think about, OK, well, here's my use case. If I have tequila, or brandy, or bourbon in my mini bar, what can I make with that? Well, hot tip, this actually does not need any kind of machine learning. Here we go back to the select statement with the group by. So this is a job for a database, any kind of database. I, in the past, have used Firebase. You could use Azure, Cosmos DB. You could hook it up to, I don't know, all kinds of other databases. Uh, there's a lot of support for, um, for different databases within uh, NativeScript View. So any generic database, in my um, experience using Firebase works really nicely because it has MLKit associated to it. How many people have been working with MLKit at all? I don't know how many mobile developers are here. Not so many. So um, it's very interesting what Firebase is doing and what Google is doing with Firebase because they have this new product called MLKit. MLKit is um, machine learning, but specifically for mobile. And they attached it to Firebase. Well, Firebase is a database. MLKit is all about machine learning. So I think what Google is doing is taking a very nice look at our data as it's filtering through our mobile apps and doing some machine learning behind it. So thanks, Google. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's what's going on with MLKit. However, it's really nice tooling, and it works really well um, for kind of standard machine learning use cases that your mobile app might want to use. It's all free. It's out there. It's very, very tempting to use this stuff. So uh, well, OK, so we'll use Firebase. We'll use MLKit. We have an incredible uh, community member, Eddie Verbruchen, who builds Cordova and NativeScript plugins. And he's built the greatest NativeScript plugin, which is the Firebase plugin, in that he has MLKit. And it works really beautifully. So we know at least that that is available to us. OK, we still have our uh, stuff in our, um, uh, our, our recipes, still in Kaggle. we got to do something with that. So you go to Kaggle and export that from Excel or from Kaggle to some kind of JSON format. That's easy enough to do. There's a couple of tools you can do. And then you just import that directly into Firebase. Now, hot tip, I'm in the process of rewriting all of this to work on Azure. So um, follow my blog on Dev2, and you'll see it's called the um, um, it's called Azure for Spoiled People. It's a whole series. I've got two articles. It's like, if you're spoiled rotten by Firebase, here's how you do the same stuff but with Azure. So this is, this is all coming um, as, as I, I worked for a month in Microsoft, and I realized I need to not, maybe not talk so much about Firebase anymore. So, um, <laughs> However, here we are. So um, OK, so anyway, blow this stuff into whatever database you want. <laughs> Um, and in this situation, since I did use Firebase and I used Eddie's plugin, I have to import that plugin and I use it right here. So I import Firebase from NativeScript plugin Firebase. That's Eddie's plugin. And then all of this functionality is ready for me to use. So it's really, really nice. He's built a lot of stuff into this plugin. Uh, and then you assign it to the prototype, view prototype Firebase. So then Firebase, all of the Firebase functionality is available to you throughout your mobile app. OK, demo time. Here we go. Now we'll just fire up QuickTime. Ooh, that's scary. <sighs> there we are. My iPhone. Hello, iPhone. OK, so let's take a look at 
Mixology. You get the pun, right? M and L, machine learning mixology. Okay. <laughs> okay, here's the app. So if I would say, okay, a hotel room, let's take a look at the mini bar. Maybe there's bourbon in the fridge. So let's view the recipes. Oh, Red Raider, limestone. Well, that's basic. Bourbon with lime juice. Oh, and some Collins mix. That's not so easy. Ooh. Ooh, bourbon, brandy, and creme de menthe. This is good. Here we go. This is what you want. Buddy's favorite. Bourbon and cold water. <laughs> this is the perfect hotel cocktail. <laughs> you don't even need ice. You don't even have to go to the ice machine. This is great. Okay. Oh, even better. Bourbon on the rocks. <laughs> This is literally out of Mr. Boston. So if you're a bartender and you need that recipe, you're in trouble. <laughs> Somebody's paying you too much. Anyway, okay, so that's that piece of the mobile app. So that is good. Um, just by curiosity, I'm wondering what we could do with gin. Let's see if there's any gin. Gin, vermouth, grenadine, yeah. So anyway, that's all being pulled right out of Firebase, out of this data set. 990 cocktails available for you. Good fun. Okay. It's okay. It's just okay, right? It's not that great. You're just pulling, you know, you're just doing a select. <laughs> so we can do better, we can do better with this. Okay, here's where the intelligence comes in, here's where the ML comes in. Let's run these bottles through some kind of image recognition service. And maybe it'll give us something a little more intelligent. Now, I told my daughter about the demo, she's like, Ma, why didn't you just make a text, make a reading of the text label? And I'm like, well, I'm in Bulgaria. I have no idea and I don't want to, it's all localized and everything. So we had an argument about it. But she saw right through this demo, so anyway. Well, if you do run your bottles through these kind of um, cognitive services, interesting things happen. Uh, I ran an image of nip bottles through uh, some pre-trained generic models. And Google Vision API says it's a bottle, a nail, finger, drink, glass bottle, liquor, ingredient, condiment, and distilled beverage. So um, that's very helpful. Um, we, we, we got that much. Here's what Clarify says. Clarify's awesome. Who's, anybody works with Clarify? It's a miracle they haven't been acquired. It's, I'm waiting for this to happen. It's <laughs> like at some point. Um, anyway, so it says bottle, wood, no person, dirty old container, Indoors, beer, hand, retro food. Th this is just not, it's just not very helpful. Um, and then for funsies, I ran this through Microsoft Cognitive Services, and it gave me a hand holding a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and then, there, so Cognitive Services has a lot of different ways to run images, and one of them has this text generation, uh, text reading, and then it posts the text that it see on top of the text. We have to do something about this, so we have to fix this. But if, you can see the little text overwritten, and it says, um, it's reading, maker's mark, straight, pours, distilled, and aged by the, so it could read that much. I think what they're using this for is that um, the app that, what is that app called that Microsoft built a while ago? Seeing AI? Yeah, seeing AI for blind people. You walk around and you can read things. Um, it's really helpful uh, in that context. And it will speak out, um, speak out the words that it sees. That's great. But for my purposes, that's not really um, so useful. So again, we're just not very impressed <laughs> with all of this business. Um, this is really a job for a custom trained model. Um, so what, is a, what are we talking about here? So what is this model of which I'm talking? So a, a machine learning model is a mathematical model of sample data built using a machine learning algorithm in order to make predictions without being explicitly programmed. So that is what a machine learning model is. A lot of sample data, run it through an algorithm, make predictions against what it thinks it's looking at. Okay, now it's time to train your model. So we kind of know what we're doing. We know that we've got to not use some kind of generic model. We need to train our own thing. Well, there's a lot of help out there, especially on, uh, on Google Code Labs. Uh, there's a really amazing code lab called TensorFlow for Poets, which is my personal favorite. It's really good. And it walks you through how to train a model and then retrain it on custom data. Very, very helpful. So it gives you a big data set of flowers, and then it allows you to train to um, visualize whether it's a daisy, an iris, or a rose, this kind of thing. So um, it gives you a great kind of start and a boost uh, in, in learning how to train your own stuff. Uh, so for my situation, I needed a local installation of TensorFlow to mimic what's going on in that code lab. I like TensorFlow a lot, 
I think um, it, when they went open source, they really busted the whole machine learning world open for all of the crazy people to get into it. <laughs> and that's been really helpful because the community is just blown up. It's really fun. Um, there's a port, a port of TensorFlow for JavaScript called TensorFlow.js, and you can train in the browser. It's it's good. It's not great, but uh, you can you can at least learn using this thing, and then you want to maybe graduate to a local installation of TensorFlow. I'm currently experimenting with what's going on in Microsoft. We've got the same kind of code labs, but within the Azure context, and you can be running your Python scripts in the cloud. That will save you from burning your Mac to pieces, <laughs> which this thing gets really hot <laughs> when not running TensorFlow and all that Python. Um, and uh, my question is, uh, where do the images get stored? I'm still figuring this out. So for me, I, I work locally. I have TensorFlow, my Python scripts, and a bunch of images that I want to train on. And those are saved in folders that are delineated. So here's the bourbon folder. Here's the rum folder. Here's the, um, you just save a ton of images in, um, in these folders. And then you can repurpose the Python scripts from that code lab to retrain your stuff. Now here is a hot, hot tip. This is the takeaway from today. <laughs> it is a nightmare to train uh, images, a uh, train on images, because you have to get so many decent quality images. So go ahead and take a video on your iPhone in your kitchen of your, um, of your bottles. Uh, just twist it around, move it around a little bit. And in about six seconds, you can get maybe 200 images easy if you uh, use FFmpeg library to break your video into images. So that's really helpful. Um, it's it's going to give you a lot of images that are slightly similar. <laughs> But it's a good data set to train on if you do a bunch of bottles. So that's what I would recommend. And TensorFlow can you know, handle any number of, of images for training. So go ahead and, and this is a great strategy. And it's kind of amusing in the evening to, when your husband is asking what the, what the heck you're doing in the kitchen. <laughs> I'm training data. That's what they all say. OK. <laughs> OK, so uh, once we've got our images all set up, you can see my, my cog, cognac and elderflower and gin and all these various folders. Everything's all set up. I have a little file here. Uh, it's my retrained labels text. So I have all the labels here that TensorFlow is expecting. So I'm going to use MobileNet to retrain on my custom categories. Now, MobileNet is there's a bunch of these kind of networks that you can use. This is an efficient convolutional neural network for mobile vision applications. So it's very specifically tailored for someone who wants to run this stuff on mobile. Uh, and it will, uh, it will work very nicely to make something um, to make a quite efficient model, which is what we need, because we need this thing to run on device. So when we test our new model that we retrain, we can, you can run one more Python script and take a random image off the internet, for example, this hand, and see what happens uh, when you use a custom trained model for this kind of image. Remember, I did this exact same image on those other models, and it said it was a dirty old bottle? Well, here um, I have something that's telling me that it is 99.8% sure that it's whiskey. That's amazing, right? Very nice. And it's not doing any kind of text reading. It's just looking at the shape of the bottle and the color and seeing, OK, it's probably some whiskey. Uh, it thinks it might possibly be vodka, but it's not at all sure. So it's pretty darn sure that this is whiskey that we're looking at. This is great. This is great. This is a really nice, accurate model. Cheers. <laughs> now we have to use the model. This is, this is the terrible part. <laughs> this is where everything kind of, kind of gets really tricky. Because um, if not, that we're going to be able to use that model that we just trained on on our device via, TensorFlow, via um, MLKit in Firebase. We have to convert that model. And we have to, to convert it from a float-trained model file to a quantized TF Lite file for use on mobile. <laughs> this is like, this is where, um, and I, I, I was just pinging Paige Bailey at Google that this is terrible. This is a terrible experience for everyone, you know, to try to, and they're working on it, but I don't know how their priority is for mobile at this point. So get on the phone with Google. Everyone in this room, please call Google and tell them that I need this fixed now. So. Um, we have to take the large float train model and comp compress it for, um, for use on mobile. You're going to compress it into this quantized format, um, and it's going to lose accuracy. So that kind of is really unfortunate. And it would be nice if we didn't have to do this stuff, if we could just take our float trained model and convert it to a TF Lite file so that we can use it in MLKit. That would be beautiful. Right now, we can't do that. So we have to use a converter tool. This one, Toco, has been deprecated in TensorFlow 2. They're cooking up something else. When they've decided what they're going to do, I'll get back to you. <laughs> we'll figure this part out. 
But eventually, you will have a TensorFlow Lite file. So the format is proper for mo mobile. You'll have your list of labels. You verify that it's quantized. And then you're ready to use that within uh, your context. And as you're going to see, it's going to lose a considerable amount of accuracy, which doesn't make anybody happy. But here we are. OK, back to some code. So here is how I'm using this uh, model and this uh, information in my mobile app. So here, I'm going to be taking a picture of bottles as I, um, as I walk into my minibar, <laughs> take a picture of the model, take that asset, and pass it through MLKit to be analyzed for what it is, to figure out what it is. So here, I'm querying MLKit. And you can see here is my retrain TF Lite file, the TensorFlow Lite file, with that little retrain labels text. It's right there. And then it's going to give me the result of what it thinks it's seeing. So it's going to give me um, a, a couple of labels. You know, is it a dirty old bottle or is it actually whiskey? So it's going to just determine what it thinks it sees according to the model that I just trained. OK, let's do a demo. Let's do this thing. Well, it so happens that. <laughs> <laughs> Auntie Jen comes prepared. <laughs> I have a funny story about this at, at, in Boston, uh, Logan. OK, so let's try it on that Maker's Mark whiskey. Let's see. Oh, we're not, no. <laughs> OK. So you can see the app. OK, so we're going to take a pick. <laughs> so this model is um, really confused. <laughs> it, it is absolutely in love with Sambuca. I don't know why, because <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe it's thirsty. But it's a lot better with gin, because I think I did a better um, bottle analysis. So let's try it on the gin bottle. Let's see if it gets it right. It's time to tank array, everybody. Uh, did I knock it? Oh, that's terrible. Oh, well, I can, oh. <laughs> Bloody hell. Did I knock it? <laughs> High five, DevOps. <laughs> All right, I'll retake that. Oops. So 61% sure that it's gin. Now, if this was a better model, it would be really sure that it's gin. So anyway, so that's encouraging. Uh, should I do one more? Let's, I'm curious what it's going to say about the Shmirnov. Oh, it's, it's when I turn around, huh? <laughs> Ooh, that's scary. Let's just not do anything dramatic. Well, this is vodka. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, it's the quantization. It's very sad. No, is it still Sambuca? Yeah. Nobody, nobody drinks Sambuca. This is not a thing. <laughs> but we have a custom trained model that sort of works. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> at least. We got the gym. <laughs> All right. So eventually, we'll get something better. OK, so yay, custom models. So now you know how to do this. So this is great. But we can do more. So this is where the talk turns left. Um, because AIs, I think, should be weird, right? AIs should help you be creative and kind of inspire you to create new ideas and to create new recipes, maybe. You know, wouldn't it be nice if you could scan your minibar and it would create something completely new? That would be really amazing. Well, if you're interested in this kind of research, you should take a look at AIWeirdness.com by Janelle Shane, which is an unbelievable website. This lady is, 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 is amazing. She trains models on all kinds of crazy stuff. And she uses TextGenRNN, which is a text-generating neural network that generates words that seem to make sense in context, sort of. So she actually took like the entire body of Harry Potter fanfic, not just Harry Potter, but Harry Potter fanfic 
ran it through a convolutional neural network and created complete insanity. Um, I think she was asking it to create movie plots based on the fan fiction. So she's very creative and I really love her work. <laughs> so it's gonna iterate through all the words in some kind of data set and, and, and find patterns and then generate what it thinks might make sense. Uh, which is usually very weird, something like this. So a bunch of seventh graders gave her a bunch of um, ice cream names, ice cream treat names, and uh, it, the neural network generated some ice cream flavors. So here we have bug, mango cats, brown crunch, peanut butter slime, uh, lemon cream grass play, strawberry cream disease. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bloody coffee, <laughs> it's dreadful. Bloody coffee. Pumpkin trash break. <laughs> Here's some generated cookies. Run a bunch of recipes through and see if you can generate some titles. So we have sugar person, sugar masts, low fuzzy feet, and merry hunga poppers. So, <laughs> my personal favorite, hand butter sacks. <laughs> yes. She also ran knitting patterns through the machine and um, asked people to generate the designs that were generated. And this is terrifying. So um, <laughs> I, I just love, I love her work. This is really, really brilliant. So like, you know, I figured why not? Let's just do this, right? What could, what could go wrong? So let's just run our cocktail recipes through TextGen RNN, since we have them all in Excel, God knows. So let's run it through TextGen RNN, which you can also run on your local machine. So you go through, you clean your JSON data one more time. So each recipe needs to be in a block so that the machine can figure out a pattern. And uh, so these are actual recipes. So this is a Gauguin, a Fort Lauderdale, a apple pie, Q, and cocktail number one. Those are all legitimate Mr. Boston cocktail recipes uh, massaged into this format with like a title, uh, about five ingredients, and instructions, maybe with some uh, instructions on garnishing and the, the glass to use. That's what the recipes basically look like. So the neural network kind of figured that out. Once you feed it to uh, TextGen RNN, you just do this locally, and it starts generating what it thinks would be logical recipes. So here is, a, I can't even pronounce it, Ramd Kfuzminster, <laughs> an Anne Dairy G. Cal Gin. Yes. Uh, but it, you know, it says, okay, that's the title. We're going to use orange bitters, a lemon twist, shake with ice and strain into cocktail glass. Like it's realistic, <laughs> uh, you know? So, so that was really cool. So I went ahead and generated 500 fake cocktails. I imported them into the app. <laughs> this is how you did it. So I parsed the, um, the data as it comes back into the app. And then I decided, well, let's enable the accelerometer because this is a freaking mobile app. This is not some piece of web running in your own device. This is a mobile app, so we're going to use mobile things. You enable your accelerometer and shake to mix yourself a drink uh, and add a sound effect as well. So demo time. All right, this one, I'm going to turn up the sound carefully. OK, so here is tab three. Oh, you know what? It's not going to have so much sound because um, it's connected into the other. Uh, I'll take it off line and you can hear, you can hear the. Yeah. So. Yes. And the recipes uh, ended up looking like, uh, anyway, apple potion with Blanco tequila, grenadine, shake with ice and strain. Is it like it's not, you know? Frozen cocktail with a lime wedge, carbonated whiskey. <laughs> oh, I like this one, carbonated water. <laughs> Venter's cocktail, rum fizz. This is, oh, this is stereotypical Mr. Boston. <laughs> Ooh, it would be all curdly. It would be like, it'd be like cottage cheese. <laughs> That's disgusting. <laughs> Ooh, this is complicated. Oh, yeah. First you stir it, then you add a lime wedge and sugar, and then shake it some more. Very nice. And strain it. Oh my gosh, with coke. Ugh. Anyway, so, so this is what I get paid the big money to do. Um, yeah. Again, oh, it's me wiggling. Well, anyway, that was basically it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
So this is all in GitHub Mixology Mobile. Uh, big gratitude to community members. Igor Ranjelovich, he's a college student in Hungary who built NativeScript View. I love this kid. He is my hero. And, um, and he, he does a great job. Eddie Verbruchen, who built the plugin for Firebase. Uh, Yona Rodriguez, who helped me with the horrible training and uh, the conversion. And he gave me the tip for FFmpeg to get the images out of the videos. So big, big help from the community on this one. That was really great. And uh, thank you so much for coming to my weird, weird machine learning TED talk. And if anybody needs a drink, we're all set. <laughs> But I don't have any Sambuca because that's gross. <laughs> Can I answer any questions? Are you going to pass the bag around with the. <laughs> <laughs> I did in Amsterdam. I brought a glass out of my purse and I gave bourbon on the rocks, except you have to get your own rocks. <laughs> but yes, if you'd like a nip, <laughs> then you're all set. Uh, any questions? Anything I can help with? I know you're inspired to go create weird mobile apps now, so this is good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the what's your what's your experience with it? Is it cross platform equivalent or do I have to do special things for Android versus iOS to make things work? So NativeScript View is at nativescriptview.org. And uh, you don't have to do a lot of tweaking cross-platform because we provide these modules. So uh, a native um, action bar is the same markup, but it looks different on Android and iOS. Same thing for like the switch. Very different looking on um, iOS and Android. Tabs, tabs on iOS are at the top and they're at the bottom on Android and we kind of handle that for you so you don't have to mess with it. However, if you want, I actually like to unify my look and feel. So I use a little bit of CSS to make everything kind of look nice. So you can customize as much as you want or not. And then we have a large plugin library with, I don't know, like 700 community built plugins. So you can um, do special Android-y things uh, or special iOS type things. Like we have special plugins for, um, um, what's well, very specific to iOS. Some of their fingerprint scanning, which works differently on Android. Some of that stuff is handled. AR kit. I think it's iOS specific, if I'm right. Yeah, all of the kit type of libraries are iOS. So um, yeah, you can use a plugin and make something very specific, or you can do what I do is make everything very cross-platform. So it's really fun. It's a great, fun way to do it. And if you like to you know, use your frame favorite framework you know, for a mobile app, and it's native. It's not Cordova. So that's really cool. Yeah. Good fun. Any other questions I can help you with? Anybody? training your own fun data and having issues and want to go scream at Google with me. <laughs> TensorFlow 2 came out, and um, it's worthwhile going to take a look at the TensorFlow Summit that they had, because there are a lot of talks about the changes to the API. Um, there's another library called Onyx, O-N-N-X, that has a JavaScript port as well. So if you don't want to use TensorFlow, you could try Onyx. This is another thing. There's a lot out there. Um, and it's somewhat hard to digest, but once you get the get your grip on it, it's really, really fun and worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really, what did the basic phones do? The native script. Basic phones, like um, it would need to be a smartphone. I think we have some limits on the lowest APIs that we handle. Oof, and I don't remember what they are. Um, in Android, does Oreo sound right? I think that's the lowest one we support. So some of the lower end Androids are not going to be happy with us. And I know I have apps running on my old iPhone 5, but I wouldn't push my iPhone 4 too hard. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> um, yeah. So it needs to be at a certain level. Yeah. That just that question reminded me of something. Could you um, like make a web app fallback if you have devices that can't handle the other two builds, but they have a web browser? Well, let's talk about web and mobile code sharing for a while. This is another talk I'll be giving in a week, actually. So ooh, there is a beautiful community plugin for code sharing uh, with NativeScript View. So you can write your Vue web app and share a certain amount of the code logic and, the, um, and even the styles uh, between your web and mobile app so that you would, you would be building your web app and your mobile app at the same time, and you're forking um, 
you're forking the markup because like you can't use the action bar stuff on a web app. So you have your specific mobile markup in one file and it's named um, home.native.view. And that's for your mobile app. Home.view is, uh, is your web app. So you can be sharing a certain amount of code. Um, I have a Mandala project that I built that is uh, running on mobile and web, if I could remember where the heck it is. Mandala Me, well, it's Mandala Me on Netlify. And this is, um, this is a shared app. Oh. oh boy. Did I get it off of this phone? Uh, anyway, you're drawing on your iPhone you get dropped off of my phone. But anyway, you draw these designs on your mobile device, and then you create mandalas on your web app. This is all out of Firebase as well. So these are all images I drew on my iPhone, and then I create my mandalas like this. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is a, a different kind of project, but it's a really nice plugin that allows you to, it leverages Webpack and the view loader. To, to fork your code. It's really, really nice. So I think code sharing is what you were talking about as a fallback, and I think it's, it's a really great strategy. Where's my mobile app? I'm sad. Mandala. Oh my gosh. I must have deleted it. How sad. I better get it back on for next week. <laughs> anyway, any other questions I can help with? As we all get somewhat dizzy and vaguely nauseous. <laughs> yeah. Maps, like Google Maps. Um, yeah, we have a plugin for Google Maps and we have a plugin for Mapbox, I think. Um, both of those are, I think, are paid, if I'm right. So you'll need to get a subscription for that stuff. But yeah, it's like go to the NativeScript Marketplace, which is at Market. .nativescript.org, and you can search for maps. Oh yeah, Mapbox, Google Maps, Google Places, G Places. Wow, there's all kinds of stuff I didn't even know about. Several plugins for Google Maps. <laughs> so, but the Mapbox, it, it, just look for anything by Eddie Verbruchen and use that. <laughs> That's what I would say. So, it's wonderful. Um, with the data, like, um, uh, so, was there any problem with the delay of getting the data? Or, uh, to, to go onto my phone? Uh, or, it's a good question because it, so it, um, so what's going on, if you notice that the Firebase stuff, um, if I'm, if I'm offline, that is not going to work so great. I, I didn't enable um, offline use for Firebase. So that is, you know, making calls out to an external cloud database. So there might be some latency there, but the machine learning stuff is running on device. Remember, I put that model right into my app. So that's the beauty of this whole strategy. You can, I could turn, I could turn into airplane mode and we'd still get cocktails. So you could use this thing on the airplane. <laughs> Just what we always needed. Yeah, so that's, that's the great thing about um, TF Lite files. You know, you're embedding them. If you use Google Translate, Google Translate kind of boosted up TensorFlow because they needed it really badly for their um, language processing. And if you notice, if you go, like when I go to Bulgaria, I download the Bulgarian model. And so the app is not completely blown up with all the language models. You just use what you need, and then you can get rid of it later. So that's a strategy for saving space in your mobile app, because these apps are going to get big with these models if, um, if you keep everything together. So lots of fun strategies. It's kind of like a UX question at that point. Yeah. Google Translate is super, super fun in Bulgaria. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you for coming. It's really fun.